It's a great honor to give the Charles Homer Haskins Prize Lecture, though it is also a tolling bell, since the understanding is that the Haskins Lecturer will look back <laughs> upon a life of learning, presumably tottering on the brink of the grave. <laughs> But one of the advantages of being old, something to set in the scale against not being able to remember if you took your medications and not, not being able to go upstairs without holding onto a railing, is that you see the shape of your life quite differently. When you look back, the shape is not what you thought it would be when it was happening, or even when you look back when relatively young. Only quite recently have I come to understand that it was my mother, not my father, who gave me many of the qualities that have made possible the best parts of my life. My life of learning and of the love of learning has been one of learning from books given in love. Most of what I learned came from someone I loved, beginning with my mother, Rita Doniger, born Rita Roth. She was a brilliant and talented woman raised in Vienna, entre deux guerres, a woman at ease in several languages and fluent in their literatures, a fine pianist, a Bauhaus trained painter. The Depression and the Holocaust had brought her to New York and wrought havoc in her education. She never finished high school, a fact that she resented bitterly to her dying day. When I was still very young, perhaps six or seven, she gave me a copy of her favorite set of books, Alice in Wonderland and Through the Looking Glass, the latter, in my opinion, the greatest work of European mythology since Ovid's Metamorphoses. <laughs> The Red Queen, who believed that she was always right about everything and brooked no disagreement, strongly reminded me of my mother. <laughs> and the White Queen, who always cried out in pain before she pricked her finger, became for me throughout my life a way of resisting my own tendency to fall prey to paralyzing anxiety about things that might never happen. Through the Looking Glass was also strongly influenced by Indian philosophy a connection noted by Swami Vivekananda and other Vedantin philosophers. Think after all about the idea that we're all part of the dream of the white king. My mother was herself an amateur orientalist who hung all over the house framed rubbings from Angkor Wat. She pronounced it Angkor Vat, which I took to be its name until much later. I started <laughs> to read about it myself. And who later amassed a fine collection of Japanese Netskis and still later Indian Ganeshas. She gave me books about India. When I was about 12, she gave me E.M. Forster's A Passage to India, which seared my soul. It's one of the books that I read in a single 24-hour binge, and that I remember exactly where I was when I read it, <clears throat> in my room in our house on the Long Island Sound. And I stayed up all the hot, humid summer night with all the windows open, listening to the crickets and the moaning of the foghorns in the sound, and then to the bird song in the morning. It made you want to study India, to go to India, to go into those caves that Forster described. I cited certain key insights and metaphors from Forster in my own books throughout the years. And then in 1954, when I was 13, my mother gave me a copy of Aubrey Menon's newly published, wickedly satirical retelling of the ancient Sanskrit epic, the Ramayana. I didn't know then that Menon's book had already been banned in India <clears throat> under Indian Penal Code 295A. <laughs> and of course, I could not know that I myself would run headlong <laughs> into that same law over half a century later. <clears throat> Another important player in my early education was the town I grew up in, Great Neck, on the north shore of Long Island, a half hour drive from Manhattan in those days, or a 45 minute ride on the Long Island Railroad to Penn Station, easily of New York, but not in it. For many years, Great Neck was one of the few towns on the north shore where Jews could buy property by that gentleman's agreement that Laura Hobson immortalized in her novel and Gregory Peck in the film, most of the rest of the island was restricted. This meant that many of the talented and successful Jews in Manhattan lived in Great Neck. Broadway comedians, Eddie Cantor, Sid Caesar. Opera singers, Leonard Warren, Richard Tucker. Composers, Maurice Jarre, Morton Gould, Percy Granger. Musicians, Leonard Rose, the entire Budapest String Quartet. <laughs> Hollywood moguls like Bob Benjamin and writers, Irving Stone. 
A greater writer, but one who was not Jewish, also lived in Great Neck from 1922 to 24, F. Scott Fitzgerald, who wrote his greatest novel about Great Neck, which he called West Egg. East Egg was the next peninsula, Manhasset, where the unattainable Daisy lived. I've always thought that the secret of Gatsby was that he was Jewish. His past was shady, he was known to have changed his name, and his business partner was an anti-Semitically depicted unscrupulous old Jew named Maya Volshan. When Gatsby gazed across Manhasset Bay at the green light that illuminated the dock of Daisy's house, she and it were unattainable because Jews could not buy property in Manhasset. <clears throat> of course, it was my mother who gave me a copy of The Great Gatsby. My high school class was the class of 1958, but I mostly hung out with the class of 1956. I actually married two of them. <laughs> I did. One, one, one at a time, one at a time. <laughs> we all read Fitzgerald, of course, but also Hemingway, especially A Movable Feast, and Malcolm Cowley's Exile's Return, and even Henri Murger's Scène de la Vie Bohème, hoping to become another lost generation. We all had grand plans. I was going to become a great ballet dancer after years of studying with Balanchine and Martha Graham. I gave it all up to study Sanskrit. My boyfriend, Dennis, was going to write the great American novel. And a guy named Francis Coppola, who has since gone on record <laughs> as saying I was the first girl he ever kissed, <laughs> dreamt of becoming a great film director. <laughs> but some of the great neckers, as we were called, who, <laughs> it's true, it's true, <laughs> who became famous were in my own class of 1958. Pulitzer Prize winners Stephen Albert and Bernie Pomerantz, who wrote The Elephant Man, and television correspondent Bob Simon, who survived 40 days in prison in Baghdad and then died in a car crash in Manhattan just this past February. Another member of my class was Barbara Stoller Miller, who, like me, earned a PhD in Sanskrit in 1968, became a full professor, was elected president of the Association of Asian Studies, she in 1990, I in 98, what sort of odds would you give that the class of 1958 at Great Neck High School would yield two women who were, for quite a while, the only two American women with university chairs in Sanskrit? Something in the water? <laughs> she too married a Great Neck boy, but only one. <laughs> Barbara and I were not friends in high school. She wore cashmere sweater sets in pastel colors with pearls while I wore existentialist black with jewelry made of bits of rough rock and hunks of wood that I bought in Greenwich Village. But many years later, when Barbara became ill with cancer, we did finally become friends, very close friends, until her death in 1993. It was not, I think, something in the water or the air in Great Neck that produced such overachievers in those years. It was something in the school, the teachers. Over the years, I've often asked people of unusual accomplishments, how did you start doing what you do? And so very often the answer begins, I had a teacher in high school. I had two. The first was Miss Lilienfeld, Anita Lilienfeld, now Seligson, who taught me Latin and then informally a bit of Greek, and one day suggested that given my interest in India and in old languages, I might try Sanskrit. The other great teacher was Jack Fields, my English teacher and sponsor of the school newspaper, The Guidepost, of which I served as the features editor and in which I published several now truly embarrassing short stories <laughs> written in a style compounded of Hemingway and the King James Bible. <laughs> But one of those stories already plays upon themes that were to haunt my academic writing forever after. It was about a masquerade and about inequality, about the dilemma of a black man who passed as white only to fall in love with a black woman who would not marry him because she thought he was white. I began to get into trouble because of my writing even then. I was chosen to be the valedictorian of our graduating class, and in my graduation speech, I urged forgiveness of the Germans. A number of parents in the overwhelmingly Jewish and anti-German audience, a congregation that had insisted that the rabbi of Temple Bethel send back his Volkswagen, 
it was just it was just 13 years after the end of World War II. A number of them wrote or phoned the principal to protest, and Jack Fields, who had helped me with the speech, took a lot of the heat. Jack Fields continued to encourage me to write and corrected my more egregious errors, a habit he found hard to drop. Many years later, when he saw a book review I had published in the New York Times, he wrote to congratulate me, telling me how he had followed my career with great interest, how proud he was of me, how much he had enjoyed the Times piece, Though it would have been even better had I left out the first paragraph, <laughs> and indeed in the second paragraph, old English teachers never die. Peter Camejo was a rather different sort of embryonic celebrity from the Great Neck class of 1958. He was the president of the Great Neck chapter of the World Communist Youth Organization. Years later, he ran for governor of California on the Green Party ticket and was in 2004 Ralph Nader's running mate. I knew him well. I was the vice president of the Great Neck <laughs> chapter of the World Communist Youth Organization. I was a red diaper baby. My mother was not just a devout communist, but a Stalinist. She was a communist because she believed that the rich should be forced to share their wealth with the poor. She never actually joined the party because she couldn't bear to have anyone ever tell her what to do, and she knew they'd throw her out the first time she became bolshy, as it were. I grew up thinking that Trotskyite was a general term of abuse. <laughs> it was not until I went to kindergarten that I learned that there was such a thing as paper white on both sides. I had done my early drawings on the backs of flyers for Henry Wallace and Ella Winter and Russian war relief, later Alger Hiss, and still later the Rosenbergs. During the McCarthy era, people like Pete Seeger and Zero Mostel drifted in and out of our house. I learned my first Sanskrit words from Pete Seeger in Gandhi's song, Raghupati Raga, Raghupati Raga, Raja Ram. So, it's Sanskrit. My father, Lester Doniger, had come to America from the village of Ratsky in the Polish Corridor in 1920 and worked his way through a degree in English literature at NYU Night School, where Erwin Edmund and Thomas Wolfe were among his teachers. He had become a very successful publisher. As he was a staunch FDR man, later a Stevenson man, there were often violent arguments at the dinner table. Napkins were thrown down, plates pushed away, only half touched. He had worked with the New York Times and published reference works, and so he would come back to the table with some such text and read out the figures, how many people Stalin had murdered or something of that sort, only to hear my mother reply, well, if you believe those capitalist rags. <laughs> I learned then that there were some arguments you cannot win. My mother also felt that the world would not be fit to live in until the last rabbi was strangled with the entrails of the last priest. <laughs> That was her phrase. <laughs> when in 1954, under McCarthy, the phrase under God was inserted in the Pledge of Allegiance, she wouldn't let me say it. And I had to go and sit in the principal's office each day during the assembly in which all the other children said the Pledge of Allegiance. In 1991, a few months before she died, Adam Phillips did an NPR program about me and interviewed her too. At one point, he asked her how, given her views of religion, she felt about the fact that I made my living writing about religious texts. She laughed and turned to me and said, but you don't believe any of it, do you? <laughs> my mother was a communist because she wanted to change the world, to do good in the world, and she bequeathed that ambition to me. But where it made her hate pious people who bombed abortion clinics and took books out of libraries, it made me admire the religious activists, the one who fought in the civil rights movement and fed the poor. My mother was against charity on principle. If there were a communist division of wealth, you wouldn't need soup kitchens. For a long time, I wanted to be a nun and nurse the lepers. I watched Audrey Hepburn in the nun story again <laughs> over and over. I had not yet heard Barbara Streisand ask, would a convent take a Jewish girl? But years later, when I confessed my childhood ambition to a friend who actually had been a nun, she remarked, well, you'd have made a great mother superior, but you could never have worked your way up through the ranks. 
In the end, like Audrey Hepburn, like my mother, I could not submit to the idea of obedience, and the nun became, like the ballet dancer, a road not taken. Instead, I threw myself into the world of political activism. But by the end of high school, I had burnt out. I no longer thought that communism could fix the world. I didn't think anything could fix the world. And I was tired of the political arguments that could never be won. From my mother's political activism, I fled to my father's profession of publishing, trading in my red diaper for a red pencil. He made books, while my mother collected books, particularly first editions. I wanted to be like him and not like her. She recycled and composted long before anyone else did, which the neighbors complained about. And she dressed me and herself in trousers that she made herself, which I hated, as all the other girls wore store-bought skirts. She never did what other people did, which embarrassed me. We fought like cats, my mother and I. My father wore elegant suits from Brooks Brothers and bought me dresses from Saks Fifth Avenue. I was daddy's girl. Within his world of books, I fled, more precisely fled back, to the fantasy world. For fantasy was a place in which I had always felt at home. Documentary proof of this is supplied by a life-size oil portrait of me that was made by my Uncle Harvey, a failed portrait painter, <laughs> when I was about six years old. I'm holding a fairy tale castle, and beside me is an open book in which you can read the words, Once Upon a Time. And within that world, I fled to ancient India, which seemed as long ago and far away as I could possibly get. Sanskrit was also another kind of refuge for me, a refuge from the intense ambition and competitiveness that was bred into me, as it was into so many children of Jewish refugees, and exacerbated in my case by my mother's own frustrated intellectual ambitions, which she visited upon me, to use the biblical phrase. I had become burnt out by the pressure in high school to excel in all of my studies, to get the kind of grades that got a Jewish girl into Radcliffe. I guessed, rightly as it turned out, that I would have no competition if I studied Sanskrit, and this too was a source of welcome respite from the fray. And so I did the right thing for some of the right reasons and some of the wrong reasons and began the study of Sanskrit at Radcliffe when I was 17. At Radcliffe, I fled almost literally to the pinnacle of the ivory tower, for the Sanskrit room at Harvard was at the very top of Widener Library, Widener A, so far up that the window opened directly onto the flat roof. And during class, I could see the pigeons waddling around right at the level of the windowsill, they're cooing a kind of background music for my recitations. I had become an old-fashioned Orientalist femme de cabinet, and my cabinet was Widener A. Its dusty air perfumed with the sweet, slightly moldy smell of old Indian books. This heavenly skywalking was balanced by the other half of my intellectual work, down in the dark rows of the Widener stacks, where on some occasions, finding what I was looking for, or something even better that I hadn't even intended to look for, I actually broke out into a sweet sweat of excitement. I studied Sanskrit with the great Daniel Henry Holmes Ingalls, who taught me not only Sanskrit, but Indian literature, Indian history, and Indian religion. He was a one-man band for Indian culture. He also taught me something else harder to define, something about the pleasure of scholarship, the elegance of the written word, the luxury of the world of the mind. He told me once that he regarded it as a waste of time to educate women, since they just went and married and had children. But he continued to teach me generously and to encourage me to go on with my studies. He had me read Kalidasa's great poem, Kumarasambhava, The Birth of the Prince, an elegant poetic riff on the story of the marriage of the god Shiva and the goddess Parvati. But Ingalls also told me that the same story was narrated in the Puranas a far simpler, sloppier, popular form of Sanskrit, which the highbrow, highborn Ingalls, his family owned the homestead in, in West Virginia, which was restricted, no Jews allowed, he regarded as the equivalent of pulp fiction. To his horror, I much preferred the Puranas to the court poetry, and this was a turning point in my academic life. I had found my level, a low-brow Sanskritist. <laughs> A rare crossbreed, 
I wrote my PhD dissertation on the myth of Shiva in the Puranas, and it eventually became my first book, Shiva, the Erotic Ascetic. So I was trained as a Sanskritist, but I was not a real Sanskritist. Real Sanskritists, Ingalls was not at all typical, are cold-blooded pedants interested only in verbs and nouns. And I was a hot-blooded ex-ballet dancer still interested in stories. Real Sanskritists on several continents have been known to turn and leave a room when I entered it. <laughs> I looked elsewhere for my intellectual nourishment. I roomed with an anthropologist, Alice Kasakoff, whom the Ratcliffe authorities had assigned to me on the very first day. In those times of unspoken quotas, Jewish girls somehow just seemed to end up with Jewish roommates. <laughs> Alice introduced me to her colleagues and instilled in me an enduring admiration for anthropologists. I also, in the manner of old-fashioned Sanskritists and Orientalists, studied Greek with Zeff Stewart, Sterling Dow, John Finley, and Adam Powery, English literature with Reuben Brower, William Alfred, and Harry Levin, and folklore with Albert Lord. One problem arose at the start of my freshman year. I read very slowly, always have, and I was advised to take the speed reading course that was offered every day at a time when no one had classes, something like 5 a.m. Of course, I didn't take it. I liked reading slowly, going back to reread early passages in the light of later ones, looking up from the page to think my own thoughts about the text. And Radcliffe continued to send me notices strongly advising me to mend my ways as this disability might well cause me to fail at Radcliffe. In those days before computers, they sent the notices by mail. And to save postage, they sent the note out at the end of the semester in the same envelope in which they sent my grades, which remained straight A's throughout my time there. <laughs> Even in the very last semester, when the envelope also contained the information that I would graduate summa cum laude and win the Jonathan Fay Prize, they included the little notice <laughs> severely chastising me for failing to learn to read properly. <laughs> When I went on to graduate school at Harvard, my life as a Sanskritist floated on in its tiny, unstructured paradise. No PhD qualifying exams, no need to fill out long application forms for grants. The relatively few people who applied to go to India were more or less automatically financed. The jaws of my graduate students drop when I tell them this. <laughs> In 1963, Ingalls sent me to India to work with Rajendra Chandrahadra, the world expert on the Puranas. Upon arriving in Calcutta and checking in at the Ramakrishna mission, I duly wrote to Hajra and went to see him. He gave me tea and said that he couldn't work with a woman. And that was the end of my training as a Sanskritist in India. I spent that year beginning to get to know India in reality after all those years of fantasy. I went up to Shanti Niketan in the Bengal countryside and learned to speak Bengali and to sing Tagore songs and to dance in the Manipuri tradition. I went down to Madras and studied Bharat Natyam with the great Bala Sarasvati. I went back up to Calcutta and met Ali Akbar Khan, who bought me a sharod and taught me to play it. I went to the Kailasa temple at Ellora and the erotic temples of Kajarao and the temple of the sun at Konarak and the caves of Shiva on the island of Elephanta and the great frieze by the sea at Mahabharipuram. I rode camels in Jaisalmer and elephants in Ajmer and trains everywhere, sleeping on the upper berths of trains or on the floor in the third class ladies waiting room at the stations. And all of it, including my round trip airfare from New York on $6,000 from the American Institute of Indian Studies, with money left over to buy the complete critical editions of the Mahabharata, the Ramayana, the Rig Veda, every Purana that had ever been published, and a three-foot-high solid bronze statue of the goddess Parvati from the Vijayanagar period. My mother came to visit me in India and went on to see Angkor Vat at last. <laughs> In 1964, with the war already breaking out in Cambodia, nothing could stop my mother, an event that she later recalled as the high point of her entire life. I flew up, flew up to Kathmandu, and in the little plain as we crossed the Himalayas, I found that I was seated next to Penelope Chetwood, who was uncannily like the Red Queen, or if you prefer, my mother. She had grown up in India as the daughter of the commander-in-chief and had now returned, she said, 
to learn Hindi. When I asked, hadn't she learned it as a child living in Delhi? She replied without the slightest hint of humor, yes, but then we only learned the imperatives of all the verbs. <laughs> this is true. This was the beginning of a beautiful friendship, which we renewed just two years later in 1965 when I moved following my husband to Oxford. Penelope taught me to ride Arabian horses up on the Berkshire Downs and also taught me a great deal about India under the Raj. In later years, I found it difficult, though not impossible, to defend my politically incorrect love of the English and my even more incorrect love of the English in India among my South Asian academic colleagues dominated by subaltern studies and post-colonial studies. In Oxford, during intervals from writing on the Downs, I eventually wrote a defil dissertation with Robin Zayner, R.C. Zayner, whose supervision consisted entirely in taking me out once a year to a very good dinner at the Elizabethan restaurant right above the shop that Lewis Carroll had immortalized as the sheep's shop and giving me increasingly drunken bits of what turned out to be very good advice <laughs> about my subject, the concept of heresy in Hinduism. Zainer at that time was obsessed with Charles Manson, about whom he was writing a book, Our Savage God. And it took a great deal of effort on my part to keep Manson and Aristotle, another obsession of Zainer's, out of my dissertation, <laughs> which eventually became my second book, The Origins of Evil in Hindu Mythology. The Sanskrit dream world continued to work its magic. I never had a job interview. I just seemed to meet people, and they offered me jobs. Again, my students' jaws drop. <laughs> Christoph von Führer Heimendorf, an anthropologist, wanted to hire me to teach in the School of Oriental and African Studies, where he was acting as director. Finding it, finding it impossible to sell me to the Sanskritists, he winkled me instead into the history department, where Bernard Lewis welcomed me and protected me from the Sanskritists, and Ken Ball Hatchett taught me some history. As a teacher, still despairing of ever changing the world, I settled instead for a chance to mend it bird by bird, stone by stone, tikkun olam, as the Hebrew expression puts it, through small random acts of kindness as a teacher, scholar, and writer, hoping to add a tiny piece to the big puzzle of human understanding. I remained alienated from the world of action, politics, reform, marching, and protest, but deeply committed to my non-actions, my trivial personal acts with great passion for helping each student writing each book. I would fight like a tigress for my students, even my less than brilliant students, to make sure they did as much as they were capable of doing, got all the breaks they could get, not in the hope that they might achieve great things when they grew up, though some did. David Shulman was one of my first students. But just for the moment of teaching, the pleasure of that, the goodness of that, for the moment when you figure out together something that looked as if it was going to be impossible to figure out to rejoice in the discovery of a new, inspired version of an old story, the way a stamp collector rejoices to find the one missing example of some rare printing with the date upside down. But never to change the world. To this day, my idea of perfect happiness is to sit in a quiet, beautiful place and write with my dog at my feet. In my decade in Oxford, my father became an important influence on my writing. He was, after all, a successful publisher, a man who knew how to read a manuscript and make it better. He read everything I wrote. I sent him all my notes from India, and he invariably loved it. My mother, her envy of my academic achievements finally getting its nose in front in the race with her pride in those same achievements, never read anything that I wrote, though she kept all of my books by her bedside until the day she died. Perhaps she did read them and never told me. My father died in 1971 while I was pregnant with my son Michael, whom my father never saw but knew was on the way. A combination of postpartum depression and grieving for my father put me into the Warnford Hospital, which was first named the Oxford Lunatic Asylum in 1826, <laughs> later the Warnford Lunatic Asylum. They actually did basket weaving there. 
and when I protested that it was a waste of my time, they let me bring in my typewriter, and there I wrote much of my book on evil in Hindu mythology <laughs> while working through my own first personal experience of radical evil. Eventually, I was discharged by a wise psychiatrist, a Holocaust survivor, who had once told me, if you commit suicide now, you'll be sorry later. <laughs> And she assured me as I left and asked her if she thought I'd end up back there again, I think you will never again experience simultaneously the death of your father and the birth of your first son. And she was right. <laughs> my father remains my ideal imagined reader to this day. He was always on my side. His voice, still strong in my ears, encourages me to take risks, to have confidence that I'll find some readers who will get my jokes, love the stories that I love, and respect my opinion even when they do not share my opinions. I sound out every line I write, imagining the reader reading it, and never imagining as the reader certain scholars who shall remain nameless, who might be watching with an eagle eye poised to pounce on any mistake I might make. No, I always imagine the reader as my father on my side. I try to be that person to my students, who are otherwise vulnerable to an imaginaire of hostile reception that can block their writing, as it keeps some of my most brilliant colleagues from publishing. My father saved me from that. The distrust of argument that had been bred in me at my parents' contentious dinner table made me in my own work very non-confrontational. And this I took after my father, who may have learned the same lesson in the same place, but was also, I think, by nature a man who wanted everyone to like him. In personal encounters, I would always go around an opponent rather than try to go through. I would refuse to write a book review of a book I didn't like. But I didn't want to write about what other people wrote about. The maternal genes in me were also quietly working their magic there. I would express my dissident opinions, but only on my own turf. If I read in a book something that I thought wrong, that ignored texts that revealed another aspect of the subject, the wrong book would inspire me to write the right book, using those neglected texts to make my own point. If the dominant paradigm was that the karma theory solved everything, and that the Hindu gods were always loving and truthful, I wrote about the many alternative narratives that had been advanced by Hindus who did not think that karma was the answer, and the many myths in which the gods were deceitful or hurtful. In Oxford, it was again the anthropologists who supplied most of my intellectual nourishment. E. E. Evans Pritchard and Rodney Needham, Edmund Leach in Cambridge, Mary Douglas in London, and later Claude Levi-Strauss. I first encountered the works of Levi-Strauss in Moscow, where I had accompanied my husband, a Russian historian, for a year, 1970 to 71, at the height of the Cold War under Brezhnev. While he was burrowing in the archives, I wandered over to the Oriental Institute and discovered the structuralists and semioticists of the Tartu school. This was the only time in my life when I found Sanskrit of practical use. Since all the Moscow Sanskritists I knew were dissidents, the Sanskrit library at the Oriental Institute was bugged. We met there and spoke what amounted to pidgin Sanskrit to baffle the KGB eavesdroppers. <laughs> Later, I met Levi Strauss in person in Paris, and we corresponded until his death. Among the many things I learned from him was an answer to the puzzle of the proliferation and repetition of myths that each version addresses a paradox that can never be solved, and so you try again and again and again. This also showed me the way of deal with the apparent paradox of Shiva's asceticism and eroticism. On a more practical level, Levi-Strauss's structural patterns provided me with a way to discuss hundreds of variants of a myth at once instead of printing them out in a large, separate volume, as I had done for my 950-page Harvard dissertation. And Levi-Strauss also showed me the best resolution of the senseless arguments advanced to explain the coincidence of myths across cultures, borrowing versus independent origination. He reasoned that one culture borrows from another only those things that are attractive and sensible to the receiving culture, hence, in a sense, original in that culture, too. <laughs> 
This validation of the link between versions of a myth in several cultures justified, I felt, my persistence in writing about cross-cultural patterns of myth, a subject that had fallen into disrepute in my academic world. <clears throat> when, in 1975, I followed my husband back from England to Berkeley, giving up my tenured lectureship at the School of Oriental and African Studies, again, an anthropologist, Alan Dundees, was my best friend, indeed, almost my only friend. I was spurned by the South Asianists in Berkeley. Only when I reached my final academic home, the University of Chicago, in 1978, did I find Indologists broad-minded enough to welcome me in. Hans van Boytenen, Milton Singer, A.K. Ramanujan, the Rudolphs, Ed Dimmick, McKim Marriott. Though even there, the historians of religion, Mircea Eliade and Frank Reynolds, were in many ways my closest colleagues and my first teachers in the field of the history of religions. For I came to Chicago under colors even more false than those I had worn as a historian in London. In 1968, Mircea Aliada had been the only official reader, besides Ingalls, of my PhD dissertation. Again, the jaws drop. He had liked it and published two long essays from it in the journal that he had just founded in 1961, the Journal of the History of Religions, of which I now serve as the senior editor. Aliada encouraged me to come to Chicago. Ten years later, in 1978, I accepted the offer of Eliade's colleague, the Dean of the Divinity School, Joe Kitagawa, and arrived in Chicago as a full professor and chair of the History of Religions area, having taken only one course in religion in my whole life, <laughs> and that one from the highly eccentric Arthur Darby Nock. <clears throat> ah, you know Nock, I see. Mm. I was able to hold my imposter nightmares at bay only by reassuring myself that I was at least a real South Asianist, and I had an appointment in that department too. <clears throat> but I also had an appointment in the Committee on Social Thought, which changed my life. In those days, the committee was a truly motley group. Nowadays, the term would be interdisciplinary. <clears throat> of people who called themselves a Salon des Refusés, maverick anthropologists, art historians, histories of, histor historians of religions, Islamicists, sinologists, one was the chair, indologists, novelists, Saul Bellow, musicologists, Charles Rosen, classicists, economists, historians of religion, Eliada was there too, all of them slightly out of step with their own official academic caste and very, very good at whatever they did. I thought I had died and gone to heaven. All of them, but particularly David Green, encouraged me to draw upon everything I knew, not just what I had been certified to know in my writing and teaching. And so I gained the courage <clears throat> to rush in where classicists and scholars of English literature, film, Freud, and feminism feared to tread. <laughs> never again would I write only about India, and never again would I have to apologize for not being a real Sanskritist. The nourishment I drew from supportive colleagues in such a wide range of academic disciplines is reflected in the rather eclectic nature of the work I did then and have continued to do. The ugly duckling had become a swan, or to quote one of my own favorite myths, I had become the woman who pretended to be what she was. <laughs> Though it was my high school teacher, <clears throat> Jack Fields, who first taught me to write, his torch was later taken up by a series of great editors. Betty Radice, editor of the Penguin Classics, who taught me to respect the readers who did not know Sanskrit. Then Philip Lilienthal, director of the University of California Press, who cut short my endless revisions by giving me a little plaque from my desk on which was written, save it for the next edition. <laughs> <clears throat> then at the University of Chicago Press, several rather old fashioned women who not only picked every nit in my text, but whose ominous words see over. <laughs> um, invariably slip, slap my wrist with a short, pithy essay written in an exquisite hand on some point of grammar or style that I had butchered. Morris Philipson, director of the press, could always sort out the chaff from the wheat in everything that I wrote. Cynthia Reed at Oxford University Press tolerated most but not all of my most egregious puns and could pierce the balloon of a blousy paragraph at 20 paces. <laughs> 
And finally, I owe so much to my great and courageous Indian publisher, Ravi Singh, known as Ravishing to his authors. You just move the H up. Whose careful editing sidestepped many political battles, but who stood staunchly beside me in the ones we could not avoid. I seem to chain smoke my books, lighting eats from the embers of the last, or if you prefer, making new yogurt from a bit of yogurt from the last batch. Each book left something unsolved, unsatisfied, and that drove me on to the next. The leftovers from the Shiva book, in which the god violates many of the Hindu codes of chastity and caste purity, spilled over to make the book about the origins of evil, in which other gods, too, break their own rules. Some of the stories about Sita and Helen in Splitting the Difference turned out to be bed tricks and demanded a book of their own. Some of the bed tricks turned out to be self-masquerades and demanded a book of their own. Some of the self-masquerades were about rings, and that's where I am now, finishing up The Ring of Truth and Other Myths of Sex and Jewelry. The red thread through all of them seems to be the intersecting themes of rebellion and masquerade. More recently, I have been drawn away from masquerade and into rebellion. I've always felt that what I do is translation, both in the literal sense, translating Sanskrit text to English for Penguin cla Classics and Oxford World Classics and the late lamented Clay Sanskrit series, and in the broader sense of translating India for Americans. I went to India through the magic door, not in any wardrobe, but in the Widener stacks, and later the Regenstein stacks at the University of Chicago, and emerged to lay at the feet of my friends and colleagues, not the silk carpets and brass statues, the lovely carvings, but stories. For of all the beautiful things that are made in India, the stories are the most beautiful of all. In 1987, the Brooklyn Academy of Music inaugurated its majestic theater with the production of Peter Brook's stage version of the Mahabharata, an all-night, nine-hour production for which my old great neck classmate Barbara Stoller Miller had served as the Sanskrit advisor. Watching the Brooklyn audience, my people, watching the Indian characters, the heroes of the Mahabharata, my people, I felt as if I had been introducing a new boyfriend to my parents, hoping so much that they would like him. I was delighted that my fellow New York Jews and others stayed up all night for an Indian play, as Indian office audiences often do, and had adored it. I was similarly delighted when my American students, and after a while, scholars and non-scholars in the broader world of letters, liked my translation of Indian stories. Eventually, I discovered that I had a very appreciative Indian audience as well, both in America and in India. Most of my books were co-published in Indian editions. Yet it has only been recently that I've taught myself to stop assuming a New Yorker as my reader, so that I no longer say we in contrast with the Hindus, just as I had to learn to stop using he as the default pronoun. I never imagined a pious, self-righteous Hindu as my reader. It never occurred to me that I could possibly make anyone mad at me by writing full of appreciation about Sanskrit texts whose authors had been dead for thousands of years. How foolish I was. And so in 2003, the hostile response to my books from the right-wing Hindu community blindsided me. After all those happy years of pure fantasy, both in my subject matter and I now realize in my own self-perception, Suddenly, I found myself fighting against real live bad guys again, just as I had done standing beside my mother in the barricades in the McCarthy days. Indeed, the seed of my problems may have been sown way back in 1954 when my mother gave me that copy of Audrey Menon's satire in the Ramayana that was banned for its blasphemous attitude toward the god Rama. And so began what I have come to think of as my Indian wars. <clears throat> Attacks began first in the Hindu diaspora in America in the early years of the 21st century and then in India. First came assaults on other, pe other people's books and then on mine and those of some of my students. The attackers in both Indian, India and the American diaspora were members of a movement called Hindutva, Hinduness, a nationalist group with roots in the early 20th century who aimed to restrict discussions of Hinduism to their own narrow, bowdlerized version of this rich and often earthy tradition 
and who grotesquely misrepresent its history. They therefore care very much about what I was saying about people who had died thousands of years ago. My response was, as always, tempered by the memory of those old, unwinnable, dinnertime Stalin arguments. I did not engage in a direct confrontation with the off-the-wall internet tirades. Instead, I stayed on my own turf and published in 2010 a book, The Hindus and Alternative History, highlighting more clearly and directly, I hoped, precisely those elements that they wanted to erase. The earthier, often satirical stories of the gods, the skeptical and even antinomian arguments, the less than pious folk versions of the great myths, the criticisms of caste and protests against the mistreatment of women. Almost immediately, a Hindu Hindutva group brought a lawsuit against me and Penguin Books India, demanding that my book be withdrawn from publication and all remaining copies destroyed. Penguin lawyers fought the suit for four years and finally settled in 2014, agreeing to the demands, though in fact no copy was actually destroyed or pulped, despite the media claims. All remaining copies were quickly bought out. <laughs> <laughs> To my surprise, there was a massive international protest. The book became a co-celebre, the Doniger Affair. Demonized by the Indian right, I became the poster girl of the Indian left. When the dust settled, Penguin generously agreed to let the Indian publication rights revert to me. And the book, which continued to be available illegally in brown paper wrappers and in PDFs on the internet, and is now legally but expensively available, Penguin India imports the New York edition, is soon to be republished in India by another Indian publisher. My response to the attack on the Hindus was to publish another book, this time a 700-page source book, the Norton Anthology of Hinduism, bringing together the texts that prove that I wasn't making it all up. And so in the end, I was dragged by den Haran, as my mother would have said, by the hair, back to the world of politics from which I had fled half a century ago. I was reminded of the man who, living in Europe in the 1930s, realized that there was going to be a terrible war there and decided to get out while he could. He sold all his possessions and fled to the safety of a remote island in the South Seas. It was Iwo Jima. The tale of the appointment in Samara also comes to mind, running into what you were running away from, or Alice trying to get to the garden and always coming back into the house. Here I was fighting the good fight after all. Well, I had been trained to do it. I was a bit rusty, but I still know what to do when the bad guys try to shut you up. Keep talking. I realized that I had to fight what my students couldn't fight because they were vulnerable in ways that I was not. They might be denied visas to India their books turned down by nervous publishers, their employers pressured by wealthy conservative Hindu donors to fire them. But I, being near the end of my career, had nothing to lose. Was I a Sanskritist in political activist's clothing or the reverse? When I entered the fray in India, fighting for my books but also fighting for Penguin, for all publishers, in a way, my reflexive thought was that my father was standing me in good stead. No, said my son Mike, grandma is standing by you. <laughs> Suddenly I found that I was living my mother's life after all, like a character in the kind of recognition I write about, like Cinderella or Oedipus. I realized who I was, not my father, but my mother. More precisely, I had become not my mother, but what she wanted me to become and what she herself would have wanted to become had she had the chances that she had given me, starting with those first books given with love. Recognizing the seed of my present moment in her hopes for me so long ago, I thought as I did so often of the words at the end of Gatsby. Gatsby believed in the green light, the orgiastic future that year by year recedes before us. It eluded us then, but that's no matter. Tomorrow we will run faster, stretch out our arms farther, and one fine morning, so we beat on, boats against the current, borne back ceaselessly into the past. Thank you. Thank you.